Welcome to Crossroads Online. My name is Steve Cordell, lead pastor. I'm so glad you're worshiping with us today. Now, whether this is your first time here or you've been with us for a while, uh, why don't you take out your phone and text XR to 313131. You'll get a link to a communicator card to let us know you're here and how we can be praying for you this week. Again, just text XR to 313131 to get that link to the card. And now, we'd love to have you take a moment to share the service with a friend or a family member. Uh, just send them a link or share the video on Facebook. And today is the first week of the season that we call Advent. Advent is from the Latin meaning to come, and it's a time of anticipating the birth of Jesus, looking forward to his arrival and celebrating that. So in Advent, each week we light a candle uh, and the Advent candles are kind of a countdown to Christmas and the white candle in the middle is the, called the Christ candle. We light that on Christmas Eve to represent the light of Jesus coming into a dark world. And the first candle we light here is the, the candle which is called the prophecy candle. It's to symbolize hope. And it's a reminder that hundreds of years before Jesus arrived, the prophets like Isaiah and others pro prophesied that Jesus would be arriving, that the Messiah would come, the light of the world. Now, today we're continuing our message series called, Did Jesus Really Say That? Let's jump into the message. Welcome to week five of our series on the Sermon on the Mount called, Did Jesus Really Say That? If you have your Bible or your app, we're going to be jumping into Matthew chapter six, so you can uh, turn to that and follow along. I remember when Holly and I were, were dating. She was just graduating a college, and I'm a little bit older, so we were both sort of relatively fresh out of university. In other words, we were blissfully broke. We had gotten used to eating ramen and buying books with borrowed money and doing work-study jobs just to sort of pay to have a roof over our heads. Now, don't get me wrong, we were blessed to have the opportunity to go to college, but we were both sort of living life a little bit on the edge. After our schooling, we began working for our alma mater and we were convinced that we were striking it rich. For the first time, we had regular paychecks, not just a stipend. And while my salary was absolutely nothing to write home about, my apartment was paid for and it was furnished. Uh, so was my cell phone. I even got a meal plan through the university dining services. So my salary was really just this gravy on top. If only I had thought about saving it. I was too busy living it up. Now Holly's position offered her a whopping $26,000. So she set her eyes on a brand new Honda CRV. So my wife is five foot zero. She walked onto the dealer's lot, she pointed at the car that she wanted, and she signed the papers they put in front of her. You, you tend to surrender all bargaining power when you do things like that. Your rate, your monthly payment, they often aren't exactly what you want them to be. About as quickly as she and I made these financial decisions, we got hit with real life. Taxes and retirements took uh, substantial chunks out of our paycheck every couple of weeks, and then, of course, there was student loan debt and the cost of eating real food for a change, plus date nights and now we had insurance, gas, and, and car payments. We both struggled pretty substantially to make ends meet, and we learned about real life adulting, sort of like a kick to the face. At one minute we were rich, we were living large, and the next, debt and bills had become the master of our lives. We started living life constantly worrying about money. We all know what it's like to feel squeezed financially. That's even more prevalent in 2020. The Motley Fool uh, offers financial news and investment guidance. And earlier this year, they published the results of a survey in which they found the following. Over 60% of Americans are worried about money in 2020. 
Over 50% have bought emergency supplies. For most, uh, those purchases actually strained or broke their budget. Another 25% wanted to buy emergency supplies, but they actually couldn't afford them. And nearly half have postponed a significant life event like buying a car or getting married or having a child. They found Americans were deeply worried about money in 2020. And for many Americans, finances are, are sort of just about holding on or, or desperately searching for more and then scrambling to protect what they can accumulate. That breeds worry in our lives. But what if there is another way? In the darkness of 2020, there was an amazing story about a man who was on a mission. Now, not many people have heard about Chuck Feeney, and that's actually by design because he has kept very quiet over the years. If you've ever seen or shopped at a duty-free in the airport, that is where Chuck made his money. A fortune that honestly is, is pretty hard to imagine, eight billion dollars. Many who are in that position, or those of us who dream about being in that position, would do everything to hold on to that money. But 40 years ago, Chuck settled on a new life goal, to give away his entire fortune before he died. But Chuck got one thing wrong though. Uh, he thought that he would be able to finish this task by 2016, but it actually took until 2020 to complete his mission. Here's a little bit more of that story. Success is success, you know. You, you, if you achieve what you think you, you wanted to achieve, uh, you, you, you operated successfully. We tried to do that. A shy American billionaire is helping transform Queensland's medical research, and in doing so, he's saving lives. And he's 81 years old. Few people on earth have given away more. The reclusive philanthropist donated $27.5 million to the improved facility. Queensland has benefited greatly from the American's generosity, which has seen him give away $6 billion around the world. Well, Chuck Feeney, who you mentioned, is one of the great philanthropists of the age. He is quite likely the world's most generous and modest donor. Chuck is the man who had it all and gave it all away. That is not what culture tells us to do with money. It, in fact, it goes totally against the grain. Even though we might admire what Chuck Feeney has done, we can also sort of justify it away by saying, well, it, it's easy to do that if you have billions. I don't know. I, I personally have not had to wrestle with that yet, uh, but I do know this. There is a different way to live, one that provides a, a healthy perspective and minimizes anxiety and worry. Not just financially, but in every area of life. Oh, come,
If you're new to Crossroads and want to learn more about getting connected, uh, I invite you to an online event called Next Step. It's coming up this Tuesday, December 1st at 6.30 p.m. online via Zoom. And you'll get to know some of our staff here at Crossroads. You'll learn more about the church and why we exist. And we want to help you to take your next step on your spiritual journey, no matter where you are starting from today. So you can register online at xr.church slash next step. I am thankful for my family, for my job, and I'm thankful that I have a good support system. I'm thankful for my family and my friends and my teacher and my pet fish. I'm thankful for my family and my church. We're very thankful for our church family and meeting everybody on Sunday, uh, whether it be through text or actually in person. I'm thankful for my family. Thank you, God, for a healthy family and dance. I'm thankful for Jesus, God, and my special family. We are thankful for each other. I'm grateful for my fur baby, Kelly. And I'd like to thank God for our family and that we're going to be becoming grandparents soon in May. <laughs> this year I'm just thankful for my church family and this church community that just gave me the opportunity to be able to lead worship together. And I'm thankful for good health this season. I'm just, of course thankful to have a job in this pandemic and hopefully the pandemic's going to be over soon. I am thankful for my family, my church family, and school. I say thankful for this place. Sing with me. We're Nicole and Dylan Corwin, and we go to the Crossroads North Fayette campus. So our financial story really begins about five years ago before we got married. We were meeting weekly with a couple from the church, and they were just pouring into us and teaching us different things about marriage. A big part of that was how to manage your finances as a couple. So they encouraged us to make a budget, but we just kind of brushed that part off. We thought we don't have a place together or bills. Dylan had a job, uh, but I was still in college. I didn't have a job, so there really wasn't a lot of data to go off of to make a budget in the first place. And then we got married and we had an apartment together and we had jobs and bills, um, but really no clue how to manage the money that was coming in and the money that was going out. So we went to buy a house and we were told we were approved, we could afford the payment. Um, we got into the house, and sure, we could afford the house payment and we could pay our bills, but there was really no margin for anything else. It felt like going on a vacation was out of the question. Um, truly tithing, giving 10% to the church was rough. Um, it felt like there was no hope for having kids in the future. Like, how could we afford that extra expense? Um, so we just kind of felt like tight with our money. So in the fall of 2018, uh, we saw an ad for Financial Peace University at Crossroads and we decided the worst thing that could happen if we took the class was this might actually work. We might actually get financial peace. Uh, so we decided to sign up. Uh, when we were in the class, uh, we met this wonderful group of people uh, that taught us how to manage our finances, um, how to do it God's way, and uh, taught us where we were, where we could go, and how to get there. Uh, one of the decisions we made while we were in the class was to tithe. I think that's made a huge difference in our finances. Um, the other thing that we did is we actually made a budget. Uh, it was super hard the first time, uh, but since taking the class, it's it's just become a part of our routine. Uh, we do it every month. Um, it's definitely helped us to communicate better too. So we are keeping track of how much money we're really spending and understanding where everything's going. It's also helped to just improve our relationship, improve our marriage, and just it's cascaded to so many other aspects of our lives. We have so much momentum now. It's been really cool to um, pay off some of our debt, and with the exception of our house, we should be debt-free next year. We also have a lot of hope, too. Um, we have hope to be able to save for things like retirement, to help pay for our son's college in the future, um, and to just be so generous with our money, which is really the ultimate goal. We believe that we've set up really strong financial habits now that we can teach our children, and ultimately that will change our family's financial story for generations. We believe because we took financial peace that we actually do have it, and that we're really thankful that we took the class. Now is the time in our service where we get to worship through giving. Giving is always an act of worship, whether it's done online, electronically, in person. Uh, and as we saw last week in the message, 
when we give, God sees and rewards. And so many people have been finding hope in Jesus this season. Uh, it's your generosity that makes that possible. The easiest way to give is online at xr.church give, or you can mail a check to the address that's on screen. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along And put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you.
we've called this series, Did Jesus Really Say That? Because we've been unpacking some pretty countercultural ideas about life. So join me in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is giving what, what really seems to look like a long list of life hacks. But really, it's just wisdom about life. How to live with less worry and anxiety. And frankly, that seems really timely as we navigate 2020. Before we dive in today, though, let's pray that we have open hearts and minds as we worship God, as we dig in to his word. Heavenly Father, God, we ask that you open our hearts, open our minds to the truth of your word. God, that we can hear from you today. No matter where we are as we tune in, God, we ask that you speak. Speak loudly and clearly through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we're going to look at two passages that are really back to back, uh, not by coincidence, but because they're, they're really tied together for a purpose. The first starts with verse 19. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we only read these uh, verses casually, we might honestly miss the main point. Jesus is not saying that money or possessions are bad, but he's cautioning us. He's cautioning us that money isn't everything. And when we make money everything, we can really end up with nothing in life. Bitcoin offers us a, a unique example of this. Bitcoin is a digital currency, also called cryptocurrency, and it's a new way to store money. Now, whatever your opinion is of Bitcoin, the truth is it's facilitated both great wealth and great disappointment. Inc. Magazine wrote about an average guy who experienced both of these extremes of Bitcoin. Uh, British IT worker James Howells moved into cryptocurrency pretty early in the game, and he mined 7,500 Bitcoins between 2009 and 2013. Now, he later sold the laptop that he used to mine those coins, but he kept the hard drive, just in case those keys ever turned out to be useful or worth anything. During a clean-out later that year, though, he accidentally tossed out the hard drive, and it ended up buried in a landfill in Wales. At Bitcoin's peak, the coins on that hard drive would have been worth more than $146 million. Now, the municipality, which adds 50,000 tons to the site every year, has refused Howell's request for permission to try to, to dig out the drive. In other words, somewhere in a dump in the UK, is a giant pot of digital money. This is exactly what Jesus is warning us about in verse 19. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus is really trying to help us avoid pain and show us that money is not everything. But Jesus also showed us where we should invest. Verse 20 says this, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. So what is a treasure in heaven? What, what exactly is Jesus saying? Well, one way to think of treasures in heaven is building eternal realities. Things like loving others, doing good, or introducing others to Jesus. The point is this. We are to invest in eternal things. When you love others, there's no taking that away. It lasts forever. When you do good for someone else, helping a neighbor or blessing a coworker, or you invest in someone else to help them achieve a dream, even seemingly small things can make a lifetime of difference. Think about it. Uh, when you introduce someone to Jesus Christ, it not only changes the rest of their life here on earth, but it also changes their eternal destiny. So a great way to invest in eternal things is simply to invest in the people around you. After all, God created them. He wants to know them, wants what's best for them. You and I, we have the opportunity to invest in eternal things, those around us, every single day. Then Jesus closes this section as, uh, with a reminder. Uh, check out verse 24. He says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, 
or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Why does Jesus say that? What well, helps to remember what Jesus is after, and that's our hearts. This is a, a truth of life. When, when left unchecked, money, wealth, possessions can be, begin to, to master us. Our time, our focus, even our emotional energy. They all begin to center around uh, gaining it, growing it, maintaining it. Money can quickly and easily grab hold of our hearts. That can lead to a life that focuses only financially and, and excludes things that really, truly matter. It leads us into worry. Jesus is offering us a better approach. We're given a choice of what to focus on, a choice of what our priorities in life will be. Like everything else in life, wealth and money, they come into a better perspective when understood through a trusting relationship with God, not just living for ourselves. And so each of us have a choice. Well, I use what God provides to make the world a better place or not. I know someone who has been blessed abundantly by God and is using those blessings to invest in significant and eternal things. They've been at work in a developing nation, striving to, to build up the healthcare infrastructure. It all started with a mission trip, but has grown to support a prospective doctor's education, uh, to finding a way to support and encourage prospective nurses, to funding a health clinic where new medical professionals can serve. Even in the midst of COVID, rather than, than shrinking back from the mission, they doubled down to go faster and bigger, getting new testing capabilities deployed. They are serving God with their finances, with their time, their energy, and their focus. And they are making a big, eternal difference. Now, you might be listening thinking, well, I'm not even sure I can make ends meet, let alone make a difference in life. Take a look at what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? You know, the Greek language uses the, that metaphor of adding a, a single hour to your life. But in Hebrew and Aramaic, they use the phrase, can worry add a cubit to your height? The point is, we all know that, that worry doesn't add value to our lives. Instead, Jesus offers wisdom that leads to God's peace. Take a look at Matthew 6, verse 33. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What does it mean to seek first God's kingdom? Well, recall that the kingdom of God is life when God is in charge. It's not referring just to the afterlife. It can start right here, right now. It's a matter of priority a matter of focus, of, of chasing after God's best. To you, maybe that sounds oversimplified. You might be thinking, well, man, if God only knew what I was going through, if he only knew what I was facing, or if you'd been through what I was going through, you would know this is not easy. Truth is, we've all lived life. We've all faced challenges. Now, maybe your challenges might be greater than mine. I don't, I don't know what you're facing today, but I do know this. Our God is greater than all of that. Our God is greater than everything. And God wants more than worry for your life. In fact, I believe that, that God has a dream for each and every one of us, that he plants those dreams deep within our hearts. These dreams are not about making us wealthy. In fact, oftentimes they go beyond our comfort zone, beyond our pleasure. I believe that God's dreams focus on our potential, the potential that's planted in each of us to make a difference. The potential that our lives can be used to make this world a better place and grow the kingdom of God. Those are the kind of dreams that build God's kingdom here on earth. But if we allow the worries of life to totally dominate our thinking, we tend to miss out on God's best. If all we think about is getting more, 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 we are likely to miss out 
on what God is doing around us. We're likely to miss the opportunities to realize our potential and God's dream for our lives. We might just miss out on our purpose. You know, my senior year of college was uh, not the smoothest. My grades, my relationships were just fine, but I was suffering from terrible anxiety about my future. I questioned if I even wanted to pursue a job in my major. And most importantly, I was worried about finances. I saw how successful my family members were and I started playing that comparison game. I concluded that my future career was an absolute dead end and I needed to find a new one. So I began shadowing to become a vet hoping to find something that was more lucrative than my original path. Never mind that I had literally never been interested in medicine before. My worry about finances actually blinded me to the path that God was leading me on. Now, thankfully, this new path didn't last all that long, and God brought me to my senses before I committed to veterinary school. When I asked God to take away that worry, even though all my questions about the future were, were far from answered, I felt a peace that it just didn't make sense in that situation. Had I continued focusing on my worries of success and dollar signs, I might have missed God's plan and his purpose in my life. It was God's peace that ultimately led me to stepping into ministry. Worry or peace? That question is practically the theme of 2020 for all of us. Will we choose worry or God's peace? Each of us has a choice today. Will we choose the, the world's worry or will we choose God's peace? Now, I don't know what your potential worry is, but, but God certainly does. It could be COVID or a job or financial pressure. It could be uh, just the stress of school or an unstable situation at work. Maybe it's family pressure. Uh, maybe it's a relationship issue. The list of things that we could choose to worry about is, is rather long. It goes on and on, but, but it is still our choice. It's your choice on what to do with it. I believe with all of my heart that God is offering us a better way today. Take a look again at Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Do you believe God's promise? If you do, then the question for you really is, will you, you choose the world's worry or God's peace? God is offering us a divine exchange. We have an invitation to exchange our worry, the weight of this world, for his peace. You know, as a church, we want to help you because financial worry is widespread uh, throughout 2020. And Christmas often only adds more to that stress. So we are offering a free one-day seminar with practical guidance. It's Thursday, December 3rd at 6.30 p.m. So uh, make sure that you register on that digital communicator card in the Crossroads app. It is a great first step to exchanging financial worry for God's peace. But it's not just financial peace that we need. It's, it's peace in every area of our lives. Maybe you would benefit from receiving some support from a counselor. Well, we can help you get connected with that resource too. Again, just mark that down on your digital communicator card. God's peace transcends worry in every area of our lives. So let's enter a time now with God. Let's ask him to speak to us. Let's take the opportunity to have that divine exchange. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we, we give you our worry. Lord, whether it's financial worry or worry about our health and the world right now, God, we give that over to you. God, we ask that you, you speak to us today. God, in this moment of silence, if there is something you want us to offer over, a, a worry, a stress, or an anxiety, God, let us know what that is. We know that you are bigger, Lord. You are bigger than the challenges that we face and the worry that we feel. So God, we ask for that divine exchange. Replace that worry with your peace, a peace that doesn't make sense in the situation. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Help us to feel your presence and feel your peace. 
Jesus' name. We would love nothing more than to pray with you today. So message us on Facebook or live chat us on our website. As you go today, go in the love and the peace of our God.